Hello, everybody. Today, we are talking about how to start an artist business. If you would like to grow as an artist and you can't afford an art class, we've got everything you need here at Art Prof, critiques, tutorials, and professional development. Well, welcome, Dorian, back to a live stream. Tell us super briefly, what is your business? So I started Blacktop Market, which is a brand that focuses on connecting the intersections of sport, culture, and exploring just the various lenses of identity through my work. So I love basketball, grew up with basketball, and it's changed my life, and I want to change the next generation of artists, creatives, but on top of that, athletes' lives as well. And I think you know a little bit about my business. <laughs> the world's worst business plan. I do not recommend any of you following that part of it. But we are pretty established. And I think it will be really interesting to hear because, Dorian, how long have you had Blocktop Market? It's been about a year and a half. So May 22nd of 2021 was when I started it officially. So, yeah, it's not been too long. I started thinking about Art Prof in 2014, so I've had a little bit more time to uh -huh. develop the business. I think out of everything we're going to tell you today, this is the most important, which is to ask yourself, what is your story to tell people who you are? Because I think there's oftentimes an assumption that, oh, if I just make awesome t-shirts like Dorian's here, that's enough. I don't need to say anything about me. The work will speak for itself. But Dorian, your story as a basketball player is incredibly important to Blacktop Market. Yeah, definitely. I started off playing in high school more seriously than I did in middle school, 100%. But uh, I got injured. And whenever I came to college, I was looking for that kind of competitive spirit, so to speak, and that competitive edge on a team. And I ended up playing for the RISD Balls. Yes, we are called the RISD Balls. Uh, and even then, it was still something that was beautiful to be a part of, like the connectedness, the teamwork, being able to be a part of something bigger. Uh, so yeah, basketball in general has really influenced what I do, how I look at things, how I interpret the world. And it gives me an opportunity to also start my business. So that's where Blacktop Market kind of started coming into the picture. Uh, how about you, though? Like, do you feel that you had a similar story of like, you love art education? So is that what got you into art prof then? I think it's the sob story, <laughs> to be honest. It's, it's the whole academia didn't want me. So I left and made my own place. And that story is important. I mean, I can teach art education all day. But Dorian, if I buy from Blacktop Market and I know, oh, he's a basketball player, that's very different than, oh, I'm just going to buy from some shop. And people forget that is so important. It's not just about the product. It's the whole identity of the artist, because I think a lot of us do follow artists for their personalities. And when you like somebody, you want to buy from them more. <laughs> Definitely. And like I like you're saying, too, I think there's a whole level of connectedness uh, within the community of sports, whether it's art, whether it's fashion, every area, every sport, whatever it might be, there's a community that is based under it. And so being able to explore the people within that community and also being able to create for the people within that community, I think, is one of the most amazing parts that I get to experience because as an industrial designer, we like to make things and help people. So being able to help people through my designs and through my work is an amazing endeavor. Really like this comment from Sentient who says, it's nice to remember that creatives are full, well-rounded people. The fact of the matter is we're not just our artwork. We are part of our artwork. That's inherent to the creative process. And so I actually spent all last week overhauling a bunch of pages on our site. And I realized, oh my gosh, I have not really told the story of who we are on our about page. So I spent all this time updating that. And I also wrote sort of a personal letter about our origin story. And I 
linked to the first blog post where I was like, I think I might do this. And <laughs> having this personal letter here, Dorian, do you think that matters? Because I could just say, oh, we're an art education platform. We teach. We talk about Benedict Cumberbatch. But why does the story here, a letter from me, why does that matter? It matters because the visibility of you, like you matter, like you're the one who's creating it and being able to give the users, the buyers, however you're looking at them, patrons, give them the opportunity to see who you are and let them support not only you, but your business, because you are technically one and the same, but at the end of the day, you're an artist and a person. So you got to find out when you separate those things. And even like when I went home to Pittsburgh, I got my mom and my uncle both to tell me, hey, you don't have any photos of you on your website, or you don't really talk about your story. And in my mind, it was autom automatically assumed versus people don't know me. Like I'm growing a business. So I have to give people that opportunity to grow with me and learn about me as well. Ginger says, I know I sometimes buy from people because I want to support them. I mean, that's basically us. If yeah. we didn't have our supporters, we would have died many, many years ago. <laughs> You would definitely not be here. And so I think there is a growing sensibility online. Hey, when I buy a hat from you, Dorian, that's very different than if I go to Target and buy a hat. I think people really enjoy that personal connection. We have a question here from Anna who's asking, what exactly do you mean by an art business? I think people can design that any way they want. I mean, I think some people it's, oh, I'm doing a commission here or there. Dorian, you have an actual shop. So whatever that looks like, wherever you are showing your work to be sold, in my opinion, definitely helps. Um, okay, let's <laughs> talk about financial systems, our favorite thing. <laughs> this is so much work. Dorian, have you found this to be time consuming? It was for me. Yeah, pricing work, starting tax identification numbers, getting paperwork for L like all of these things add up to create not only a successful business, but a fluid business. So I'm still learning a lot about it, especially in my first couple of months, like experimenting with pricing, shifting what like you can even see some things can be on sale, some things aren't on sale. So that also comes with engaging with your audience as well. By the way, tell us in the chat, who here has an art business already? Who here is thinking about it? And who here is like, no way, <laughs> because it's not for everybody, for sure. Now, the pricing thing drives everybody crazy. I find it extremely frustrating. And we have so many services, the artist calls, the portfolio critiques. We have multiple versions within there. And so I had to come up with, I'm not kidding, probably at least 50 different prices, if not more than that. And it's nerve wracking. Was pricing hard for you? Was it um, a, a constant questioning? Because it is for me. So I think I started off feeling a little bit confident and like, yeah, this price is perfect. It's not too expensive. And then I look at how I want to interact with people that aren't necessarily trying to spend $600 on pieces. So engaging with the audience again, just figuring out what works, what doesn't work. Uh, and it got to the point where now I use an actual calculator where it tells me all of my expenses for the month. Uh, it tells me how much I spent on the actual supplies how many hours I'm putting into the studio. And then it calculates all of those factors into this is a reasonable price for how many screens, how many shirts, how many layers, and it builds off of that. So uh, when I'm doing my one-off pieces though, that's a little bit more subjective. I get to play around with those prices as much as I want. Crispy's asking, would having an Etsy shop be a quote art business? So there are so many tiers of a business for example, a lot of people have an Etsy shop, but they don't have an EIN, which in the US is a federal identification number. So you are actually registered as a business. ArtProf is an LLC. So I had to do paperwork to register my business as an LLC. But the thing is, you don't have to do that. I know tons of people, they just sell on Etsy and that's it. But Dorian, you've done some of that, right? 
Yeah. Uh, and I'm actually in the process of applying for an LLC. Uh, but I think the biggest thing, selling on Etsy and selling on those websites, they get a portion of your profits. So I think the one of the things that made me kind of step away from that is I want to be able to not only have the profits to put back into my work, but I also want to start bringing people into the fold and having a support system of creatives that are also able to get paid properly because all the money's coming back to us. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Manette says, I started an Etsy store last month. Don't expect much from it right now since it's so new, but I'm nervous that things won't pick up as time goes by. You know something? Mm -hmm. I remember the days that we would live stream and we were like, oh my God, eight people watched today. We were flipping out over that. I mean, right now we have 52 people watching and oh my gosh, it took us years to get that following. And get through with the business, it's a lot of work up front and growing it, it's slow. I mean, I don't think you sold out the first day you opened, Dorian. Uh, <laughs> so technically I did actually, but that was- you rare... did? <laughs> what? Oh crap, <laughs> that was bad advice. Did you, what happened? So uh, May 22nd, 2021, me and my friend Beyonce, uh, if you actually, reference the last video, you'll see a couple of the videos that we did together in that. Uh, but yeah, I sold some of my first sets of shirts and it was a robot t-shirt that I had screen printed. And I guess everyone loved it and that's what sold out immediately. So what? after that, I was like, okay, maybe I should start a business. And that's kind of what actually pushed me into going into Blacktop. Uh, oh. And it wasn't even called Blacktop Market then. I've changed the name three times. I've changed the logo. The website's undergone changes. So even though you're just starting and it might be slow, give yourself the time, give yourself the patience and just keep making work, keep being prepared for the moment that it might actually get bigger because it's never too late. So actually you didn't plan in advance that you were gonna start a business. It was based on this experience? Yeah, a everything that happened with Black to Market started with OG Sportswear which was my thesis project. And yeah, everyone loved what they saw and they asked me if I was gonna keep doing more. And that just kind of made me say, okay, screw it, I'm sending it. <laughs> I love it. So here's another thing, create your goals. That's very important. If you have a business and you don't really know what your goals are, it makes your life very difficult. But one way that we have done that is to look at our metrics. And I have a unhealthy obsession <laughs> with our YouTube analytics, but this is so critical because you start to understand, okay, what are people responding to? What am I doing wrong? Like audience retention. If people are dropping off within the first 30 seconds, it probably means you're doing something wrong. And it's funny because initially our business was all people who wanted to apply to art school. Mm -hmm. But now it's totally flipped. That's only a small percentage of our audience. And I know that because of the analytics. Now it's mostly lifelong learners. So Dorian, have you had time to review metrics and stuff like that? So my sophomore year, I did an internship at a place called Food Innovation Nexus. And I was doing social analytics, studying that. But it wasn't for my business. And I understood what I was doing, but it wasn't really helping me, so to speak. The knowledge did, but the actual information wasn't. So currently I don't have enough of a following, so to speak, of black top marketers that want to get stuff. And that's where I'm building it up so I can actually see who's present, uh, et cetera. But I feel like for you, how do you feel, how soon do you feel you started actually looking into this stuff and it, how much did it influence your growth of your business? It's everything because you really don't know what people want. I mean, that's why I'm always asking all of you, oh, should I do a stream on this? Or, hey, what's the next topic you want to do? I have no idea what will help you guys, honestly, even though I'm a teacher, I, I have no idea. I don't know where the gaps are. So when you all tell me, oh yeah, you haven't covered this, I go, oh my gosh, yes. I'm going to do that. So 
I think actually you don't need a following to get something out of your metrics because let's say you have 10 people watching, you can see how 10 people are reacting. And that's mm -hmm. very important. And we've changed our goals. For a long time, we had 10 videos. Now we have over a thousand. <laughs> so things change after a while. Just a little bit. <laughs> a little bit. Yeah. So you've had to learn a lot of new skills for your business. I know the creative suite, you had to take a real deep dive, Dorian. Yes, definitely did. Uh, Illustrator is my favorite one out of all of them easily. I love using vectors and working in Illustrator. Uh, Photoshop is the worst one in my opinion because why why change the shortcuts? Why change the keyboard shortcuts? It doesn't make sense. <laughs> uh, but yes, yeah, having to learn Illustrator, Photoshop, uh, Lightroom for editing photos, uh, XD whenever I want to do mockups of my website in different ways, uh, InDesign for whenever I want to do my lookbooks and catalogs for the year so there's like all of those sites and sources and apps that have really helped build the business and make it grow a lot faster than it would if i didn't learn and take the time to actually grow with those and oh my gosh i had to learn so many different softwares and it's time consuming was it for you i know you had to learn screen printing yeah, uh, I actually worked with a local screen printing company uh, called Milk Can Industries. So I worked with them and they she taught me basically everything I needed to know in terms of how to lay it out on the screen, experimenting with the times to burn them. Uh, there's also another screen printer, a local screen printer. His name is Paul. He works with us at Revival Brewery. So like I've had people really giving me the knowledge and the tools to actually succeed in what I'm doing. and above all else it's given me the room to actually play with what i'm doing because more than anything in id i think the one thing they push us to do the most is play with our work uh, play with the process and just go for it because the worst that the worst thing that can happen is you just have an unfinished piece like a lot of that stuff on the bottom left photo i haven't released but it was cool to make it taught me about my process it taught me you know layout just graphic elements I wasn't necessarily aware of until I actually did it. Artist Vav is saying, at what point did you know you needed to legitimize your business legally? What might be some indicators of needing to take that next step if necessary? For me, it was having to pay employees because I had to put people on payroll and you cannot do that without establishing a business. I had Greg Kanan who is a wonderful lawyer. We've had him on streams before and he set up all the legal paperwork because I had to have an employee contract. I had to have an LLC um, legal documents for all these different kinds of things. Now, Dorian, you're not there yet in terms of the LLC, but what's making you think you should do that? Uh, I think the biggest thing about LLCs for me is it separates the work and the business from me as an entity. So being able to have my work as separate from me is very important because all my ideas, all of the money, uh, starting a separate business account, having that in place, having just blacktop market be blacktop market rather than it's Dorian Epps and blacktop market. I feel it gives it a lot more room to grow. Ginger's asking, how did you decide on that name? Okay. <laughs> Well, so as I was saying before, it started as OG Sportswear and the whole premise of my thesis was to explore the society's effects on black culture and the inverse effects of black culture on society. So I wanted to talk about the 90s, the vintage feel, the aesthetic of it, and also what it provided for not only basketball, but just the culture, like black culture in general. So when I started playing with that name, it really didn't get too much of a hit. Uh, so I ended up going to Blacktop Market, which was thinking about, OK, in the summers, I want to start going to basketball courts and I want to start selling the work that I have because this is for basketball players. This is for athletes. And Blacktop Market just kind of had a nice ring to it. So it also gave room for cool design, cool logo, cool branding. And beyond that, it means now that I can do more than just sportswear, which was what I originally thought I was just doing. Now I'm doing streetwear, I'm doing footwear, uh, I'm doing screen printing. So 
there's a lot more parts of the business and it's not limited to just OG sports where like it doesn't have to be this vintage thing anymore. That's such a good point, Dorian, because if you have a business name that's too specific, it can hurt you if you decide to add different things. So if we right. called art prof painting prof, <laughs> it would be a little weird to be talking about ID and upcycle fashion and all the other things we do. And so if we are just art prof, we can put whatever we want underneath that. So coming up with a business name is hard. And I like that you said that you what, changed it three times. <laughs> yeah. Before that, it was old sport. And I was like, uh, that's that sounds a little bit too much like the great Gatsby. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a little uh, off, I think, <laughs> what you're trying to do. Exactly. Th this is a make or break thing as far as selling. You have to have good photos. I don't know if you've ever had an experience, Dorian, where you see something online and you're thinking about buying it, but then you see this terrible photo and it's such a turnoff. Yeah. Like, so for your work, like the thumbnails and everything, I think you actually also help motivate me to start looking at the photos better. Uh, how do you select your thumbnails? Like what process do you put into not only that, but also, I guess, the work that you're actually creating in the videos like how how do you choose what's the best part to capture someone's attention oh it's so hard i'm still struggling with it but this is a good example so for example this is a video about social media tips okay now i could have had this thumbnail just as it is but the key thing about this thumbnail is the instagram icon because that's what people latch on to if i just have a picture of deep d people are not going to click on that. And so sometimes it's something that's like really in your face, but sometimes it's a silly thumbnail. Like we had this stream about fears as an artist. And I put this big red picture of a woman screaming from the Alfred Hitchcock movie Psycho. So that's sort of a silly thing. So it's really hard though, because photographing your work, it's a lot of work because Dorian, don't you have to like hire models to wear all your stuff? So actually... At one point, I was doing a couple of photos with models. Uh, my friend Mandon, who was actually in the photos earlier, he's a photographer in Providence, and he's done a lot of photos for me. I also have my friend Angelique, who does photography, videography. This is high <laughs> uh, But yeah, I've had a lot of friends that really have helped me and not charged me. Uh, and more often than not, I also model the stuff, but this week it'll be the first week that I'm not the model in the clothing. So I'm excited for that. Uh, and also just having clean backdrops, by the way, yep. making sure that the shirts aren't wrinkled, making sure that everything is legible, that you want to be legible. And yeah, just making sure that you're actually giving your work and the photos of your work, the credit that they deserve, because if you work hours on something, people won't be able to engage with it and appreciate it for what it truly is. Speaking of photos, <laughs> showing your face really does help engage with your audience. For example, we do have this photo of you modeling the stuff. Now, I know you don't want to model it every single time, correct? But <laughs> the fact that we see you here with it's the duffel bag you designed right yeah that was the very first duffel bag i ever did so yeah. that was a learning process in itself so to me this one photo encapsulates your business extremely well because it's you it's the basketball and the duffel bag and it's a beautiful photo who shot this uh so this one was actually taken by one of my closest friends his name is z zaire he's an actually he's actually an architecture so the layout of that photo makes a lot of sense for an architect major. But yeah, he's a really talented photographer, took all of my thesis project photos, and I have amazing ones to hold on to now. And the other thing about um, photos is they have to be diverse because you do have photos where it's just the bag, and that's important. And so probably I would guess, Dorian, that for each of your items, do you have multiple photos? Yes, I don't like to sell a piece or give away anything until that piece has been photographed at least five different ways. Uh, I like to have it in a different setting. So it has to be 
a live setting where it's actually being used. It has to be in a isolated setting. So just photos of the bag, highlight certain areas of the bag so people know what they're getting. And then, yeah, I don't know. The rest of the photos are just kind of, if it looks good in a spot when I'm walking, I'm like, okay, that's what, that's where it's going to be. <laughs> Anna's asking, how do you balance what you want to do with what your audience wants. Oh gosh, Ooh, this is the bane of my life, cool. Anna. <laughs> <laughs> well, because I have tutorials that I'm like, you know what? Nobody's going to be that into dry point. Most people don't even know what dry point is. It's sort of an obscure intaglio printmaking technique, but that's one of my specialties is printmaking. And I loved making the dry point tutorial. But then I also know, oh, people really need a video about color saturation. And we find ways to make it fun. You guys know that. But um, Dorian, have you ever felt pressure? Or a nodal cell? Or have you avoided that? Your connection broke up a little bit. I heard, have I ever felt? And oh, then... I'm sorry. I'm oh, no, sorry. You're good. I'll do it again. <laughs> so... So I'm wondering, have you ever felt pressure to make things just to sell or are you trying to keep that separate? Yes, I constantly feel the pressure to sell because a business costs money and money means you have to make sales. So I am finally at the point now where I'm comfortable with making a couple of things that the audience specifically has requested and wants because that's why I'm doing it. I'm making it so that they can enjoy the things that I'm creating. But that doesn't mean that I shouldn't keep exploring and making passion projects and doing things on the side that I can also contribute to black top market. So when I'm doing the one-off pieces, when I'm doing the denim duffel bags, uh, I'm doing like denim shirts, like all things from donated materials too. It really has made it so that I can is the best way of saying it. I am able to make what I want and still do what the audience needs and wants from me. I think it was Trent, one of our Discord moderators. This might be from somebody else. I have no idea. But the concept is one for them, one for me. Mm -hmm. And so I have to make space to make the stuff that's fun for me while also fulfilling what my audience is looking for. And it's hard because it's always the fun stuff that doesn't pay well. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> right. Hashtag being an artist. <laughs> Gosh. All right. So the next one is identify your target demographic, age, profession, location. Could be any one of these things. Okay. Deep D found out that her biggest audience for her Sculpey pins was art teachers. Isn't that so funny and specific? Like, <laughs> why that one audience? And this surprised me. We just did this survey about our programming. And look at 62% are lifelong learners. So I can say, yes, we do have college students and high school students that watch us. But this is incredibly valuable. So, Dorian, who is your demographic? Do you even know at this point? <laughs> so, according to Instagram, it's people within the ages of 18 to 25. And more than anything, it's usually the younger audience that wants to wear streetwear. So, the analytics made sense. But other than that, I don't know too much about the demographic as well as I should probably, but I am still learning, still trying to get some new skills. And after you saying analytics, no matter how small, I think I'm definitely going to be looking a lot more into my analytics. I feel like our demographic is the hardest one. I'm not kidding. I've had, I had a parent once who messaged me and said, my kid is 11. He loves your videos. I was like, what? <laughs> I never thought an 11 year old would like them. But then I get emails. People say, I'm 80. I'm retired. I love your, and I'm like, oh my God, how do I format things for such a broad audience? Because I mean, Doreen, you're sort of lucky that your audience is smaller in demographic. And 
it's it's really difficult because I have to accommodate so many different learning styles mm -hmm. and maybe for you that's a good thing so then i have a question for you do you feel like there's one video that you've made so far whether it's with somebody or a, a solo video uh that you think connects with all ranges of your demographic or at least connects with most ranges of your demographic and if so which one? Oh gosh i don't think there's one like that at all because i think the audience for every video is different I mean, some people are like, I need to learn oil painting, but oil painting's not really for 11 year olds, you know? So I think that's why we have over a thousand videos, why we try to cover so much, because most YouTube channels are, I draw flowers and colored pencil realistically. It's like extremely hyper-focused, mm -hmm. but that's what I like about your business, Dorian, is that it's not hyper-focused. You, you have a duffel bag, you got a hoodie, you, and you've got so many different things. Are there any things that you want to do in the future that are different than what you have right now in the shop? Yes. Uh, my dream goal, my end goal, my everything has always been to have a shoe that I can sell. And oh. I, I've always wanted to develop a shoe. Uh, basketball players, their injuries are directly linked a lot of the times to the but where they have, uh, like even Zion, his sh foot literally went through his shoe in, I think it was his first NBA season. So it's like things like that really motivate me and push me to want to create a shoe uh, because I want to protect the next generation of athletes. And it would just be amazing to see somebody wearing something that I've created on their feet. Like that's, that's amazing to think about. It, sorry, I just feel like a kid. I'm like all giddy thinking about it. <laughs> we're, we're gonna hold you to this, Dorian. Now you're accountable <laughs> to, to release a shoe. Within the next year, I will have something started and we'll hopefully have some feedback given to me from you guys. <laughs> cool. So Seven Angelic is asking, when does it seem like a better idea to go solo rather than sell via vendors or other, I'm guessing, physical storefronts? Have you done that? Have you sold your stuff in a physical storefront? So I, the first time I sold in a storefront was in Pittsburgh and I was actually making dog feeders. So like the bowl holders for dogs, but they're Pittsburgh themed. So like that was a cool experience, but I haven't really operated with stores since then because I feel the freedom of going to pop-ups and doing the flea markets. Uh, I don't know where you're based, uh, Seven Angelic Enigma, but I'm based in Providence right now. So there's a lot of flea markets, a lot of pop-up events, a lot of sales, a lot of opportunities for creatives to really support one another. And above all else, they are also able to sell a lot of their work because they're around other creatives. People that are creative, typically want to support other creatives. So I don't necessarily think there's a time that's better to go solo until you actually get to that point in time. And whenever you see your business having an opportunity to get in the eyes of the public, take that opportunity. It means a lot more than you would ever know. And that's a great place to get instant feedback because you see physically what people do. Like you remember these people, they, they come up and they just look and they leave right away. Like, yeah. <laughs> has that ever happened to you? Like I look at them, I'm like, hi, how's it going? They're like, Ooh. and then they keep walking. And then like two minutes later, I'll have like an excited kid who's like, that shoe's so cool. Like, actually, yeah. <laughs> that shoe's so cool. Yeah, this is like one of the, pieces I, did. I think I showed in the first video too but yeah having pieces like this to grab people in it always helps because then people are like okay well what other pieces do you have and then you just start going down the line and getting actual feedback yeah really really helpful to have that so I would highly recommend if you guys want information about starting a business look at Greg Kanan's Instagram. He's fantastic. He's been on live streams with us. He's my lawyer. He did all the paperwork for Art Prof. You, you're going to need help with your business. This is not something you can do by yourself. So don't think like me, you're going to do everything because you won't. Like Dorian, you must have had a lot of people help you. Yes. Everything takes a community. Uh, one of the biggest helps or biggest helpers to me 
has been Jess Brown from RISD, a RISD professor, also a local activist and artist, uh, and Matt Billings and Jess Aiken. They're all creatives in the field, experimenting and doing what they're doing uh, and succeeding at it. But above all, they give back to the community, they give back to people that are just starting. So without them, I wouldn't have a lot of the knowledge that I do of my business or the things that I want to do with my business. And also you, because you've actually helped me a lot in the short span that we've really been talking. So yeah, it's there's a lot to a business. Do you feel that you had a lot of support when you first started our prop? Oh my God, no. I, I had people crapping on me left and right. right. I think you want to teach online. I mean, I had somebody say to me, oh, why don't you just teach a class on Skillshare? I'm like, I don't want to teach on Skillshare. I want to customize something that really is made for artists. So I'm hoping you didn't have that experience. It's mostly because I was in academia and it was like, oh, if you're on YouTube, you're trash. It was the worst. And then the pandemic came and all those people who trashed me came crawling back. And I was like, <laughs> now you want all the things I learned. It was just oh, revenge. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Consistent branding, extremely important. Now, I know for a lot of artists, the word branding seems evil and corporate, but I'm sorry it's important because this logo didn't always look like this. And in fact, this is the original photo. <laughs> I, took, so cool. and I, I had a page that was like eight blobs of paint because I had to get the right shape for the blob. And then I ended up editing it later and you guys can see it's a little bit smaller. So is branding something you've thought about, Dorian? Yeah, that's the whole reason why I changed the name three times because I needed people to be able to not only relate to what I had, but also want to get what I had. Uh, I think it took me probably three months to actually be comfortable with the name as well. So there is a bit of a time whenever you have to sit with something and let it simmer yeah. and see how people are digesting it. Uh, mm -hmm. Because like art prof, it's such a, it's so simple but it's so effective in being like, you can learn, like this is art education and black dog markets. Like this is definitely related to basketball and it wants to be something that sells work related to that. So finding ways to have that kind of immediate branding and that identification, I think is something that's really helpful. Uh, and also having a logo, definitely oh, yeah. have it. logos change everything. Like having tags on my shirts and stuff that I sell now, yeah has elevated how people view everything so much. Listen to your audience. So important. I know that I don't have time to reply to every comment online, but I read every single one. And guess what? Lisa is the reason there is a Google Calendar link for the live streams because we can't think of everything. Have you gotten suggestions from people to, oh, I wish you would add this? I mean, it's so helpful when people give me that feedback. Yeah. Uh, specifically on my website, I have an area where it's like, notify me when this is back or send message to the Black Top Market about getting this back. And like, people want what they want and people also have ideas. That's why we're doing these things so we can hear their ideas and incorporate them. Or if they're a bad idea, it gives us an opportunity for dialogue with our general audience. So yeah, uh, I've had a lot of feedback. I've had a lot of people tell me like, I would think you should do this. I think you should do this. And whether or not I do it, that's on me. But it's always appreciated to get some feedback to try and elevate the business to the next level. On the other hand, though, you also have to block out some people. <laughs> We're big enough now. The, the way I knew we had hit, not the big time, but we're legitimate <laughs> now, okay? We're, we're not just some fledgling thing. Um, is when we started getting trolls, people saying things Ooh. like, Clara, you don't know crap about oil painting. You think you're so great and cool. And I'm like, goodbye. And it's hard <laughs> because some days, like I, I confess that sometimes I will hear a comment like that and it gets to me. And it bothers yeah. me that it gets to me. Does that ever happen to you? I, 
it's so tough because my whole education focused around listening to people and taking what they had into consideration. And so I know when people get really famous, they don't even look at their Twitter. They don't look at things because they know it will negatively impact them or sometimes disrupt their work. So right. it's, it's, a, it's a struggle. Like social media, I try and take steps away from whenever I post, I stay engaged with it for the day, just walk away from it after, and then take a second, think about what I'm gonna do next and then do it again. Everybody we have an Art Prof Share today. Art Prof Share is where you create artwork in response to our content. And so we have Anastasia today who finished the personal narratives track. And she talks about, she wanted to do work about the future, the stories from my past I was afraid of. I'm no longer afraid now. And she says, I associate the track with something dark and uncomfortable to share. This is how I interpreted the prompts. I consider art to be a legitimate form of oversharing, talking about drinking, bullying, penalties, injuries. And I believe art is effective as healing as the hot iron is sealing the open wounds. So Dorian, to explain to you, because you're a guest, a personal narratives track, what you're looking at now, this is one of our tracks. It's a yeah. sequence of video lessons and prompts that people do at their own pace. There are six lessons. And this is a lot of work because when we were in art school, you have professors breathing down your neck, but Anastasia did this totally by herself without anybody pushing her. And that takes discipline. Oh yeah. Consistency is key. <laughs> Absolutely. And I mean, Anastasia did these mood boards. She also did these wonderful thumbnails. And I just think the images here are so rich. I mean, doesn't this feel emotional to you? Yes. It, I, this also makes me feel like I'm at home because this feels like a still you know, still industry. This is so yeah. beautiful, though. And guess what? Anastasia is here live with us in the chat. That is so cool. And I, I just am blown away that all of you have such dedication to your work. You're not doing it for credit. You're not doing it to get paid necessarily. And this is a ton of work, everybody. So congratulations, Anastasia, for finishing the personal narratives track. I'm so proud of you. Like, this is one of my favorite things is really Oh, that was our audience. Yeah, this is great. Okay, everybody. Remember, we are doing registration for our workshops. It is due on Friday. We're doing one on composition and thumbnails. How do I price my art? Finding your art style, creature design lab, collage and mixed media experiments, and marketing for artists without the cringe. You'll get information on the homepage of artprop.org to register. I've been having so much fun. Join us immediately after the live stream. Dorian and I will be in the Discord. We'll be in the post live stream stage channel. And this is where you get to talk to us on voice. So I hope some of you will join us over there. Please join our Patreon group. We have so much fun in there. It's a much smaller group of artists than the public Discord channels. You can share your art in weekly voice sessions, vent about all the struggles of being an artist. You can boost your skills, support from me, critiques from me. I really am not active in the critique channels that are public. So the Patreon group's a good chance to do that. I have a lot of videos that I need to make, but I need your support. You can sponsor a video. You can give us the funds we need to hire a model who's going to pose in real time. I can shoot you reference photos, but we need your support to make that happen. We have services you can all check out to help you get really hyper-customized advice. And a big thank you to our top Patreon supporters. I, I am so, like, you guys here are so loyal. People have been dropping like flies on our Patreon. And it's like, wow, these people have stuck with us for years in a lot of cases. So thank you all. Visit artprof.org for content that's not on YouTube. Please use the search bar. Art Prof has a podcast. It's available on Spotify and also on iTunes. Subscribe to our channel for more tutorials, critiques, and business tips. 
everybody, thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next time. Bye.